Welcome everyone to First Amendment Under Fire. I'm Shireen Tagarobi. I'm an attorney and former journalist. I'm currently a legal fellow at the First Amendment Coalition and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion, but I also more than welcome your participation and questions. So thank you all for being here and feel free to submit any questions you have to the chat log. Uh, the chat log with everyone is the one that will be keeping tabs on. So if you send it directly to a panelist or directly to me, um, that might be missed. So uh, definitely send your questions to the public chat log. And um, just a heads up that today's event is being recorded and it'll be available um, probably in a few days on sanjosespotlight.com. So you'll be able to um, relive the discussion, revisit it and share it with anyone else you think might be interested. Um, our panel is co-hosted by the First Amendment Coalition and San Jose Spotlight. The First Amendment Coalition is a nonprofit Bay Area based organization it's dedicated to protecting and promoting the freedom of expression and the people's right to know. And uh, San Jose Spotlight is the city's first nonprofit news organization dedicated to independent political and business reporting. Its mission is to change the face of local journalism by building a community supported newsroom that engages, uh, ignites civic engagement, educates citizens and strengthens our democracy. <clears throat> so diving into the discussion, speaking of democracy, it's long been recognized that the First Amendment freedom to record and document history serves a democratic function. As a federal judge put it earlier this month, the public became aware of the circumstances surrounding George Floyd's death because citizens standing on a sidewalk exercised their First Amendment rights and filmed a police officer kneeling on Floyd's neck until he died. That image became a rallying point for Americans who could no longer turn a blind eye to generations of injustice, but rather than protect protesters and journalists exercising their First Amendment rights, in some instances, police suppressed them. At the same time, the challenges of crowd control and maintaining public safety amid this historic uprising can't be ignored. So it's the tension between these interests that we're focused on here today. And that tension certainly hasn't spared the city of San Jose, where today we zoom in. What have we learned from a season of protest? And here to help us find out are five incredible panelists that we'd like to take a moment to welcome. First, we have Sharon Watkins. She's a community activist with Silicon Valley Debug. She's participated in dozens of marches and has pushed for police reform. Ramona Gawargis is a journalist. She's co-founder and editor of San Jose Spotlight. Council member Raul Perales, serving San Jose Council District 3, is a former San Jose police officer and a current reserve officer. And Nikki Moore is committee counsel for the California State Assembly Committee on Public Safety. She's also worked on landmark police accountability legislation as an attorney with the California News Publishers Association. Finally, Tania Rodewald is an attorney at the Silicon Valley office of Shepard Mullen, Richer and Hampton. She's been lead counsel on numerous police transparency cases and authored the newly released Transparency uh, Police Transparency Guide in partnership with the First Amendment Coalition. Now, Sharon, I'd like to anchor this discussion in your very real life experience, because I think starting there will help people understand why all of this matters. Why do we care that we know how police are being held accountable? Why do we care that people are able to voice their concerns and make change in their community? And first of all, I know this isn't comfortable for you to talk about, so I really appreciate your being willing. Um, can you describe the officer-involved shooting that killed your son, Philip Watkins, and how that life-changing experience has inspired your own activism? Um, sure. First, I want to say thank you for having me here, and I appreciate everyone that has tuned in 
and taking that time to listen and that cares about it. Um, my son was killed on February 11, 2015. I received a call, I was at work, I received a call from his fiance. And she said that Phil is having some kind of psychotic break. He is talking about killing himself. Um, he was not in the system with having a history of mental illness, but nevertheless, it, he was going through some type of mental breakdown. And uh, as I was, uh, of course, you know, shocked and, uh, and rushing to get to the car to get there, uh, and then she started saying they shot him up, Sharon, they shot him up, Sharon. And it was, it was the stress level was trying to get to my car and to get there and just praying that he was still alive. It was, it was, uh, it, it was a moment that it, it's for a long time, I couldn't even walk that, that distance from my job to the parking lot in that same direction because uh, I would relive it. And, and, um, each time when, um, when I relive that, there are things that I don't remember. When I had the deposition, they were asking me questions and I still don't remember. Uh, the effect that it had at first was like disbelief. I, when I finally made it there, I couldn't see him because they had, he had been taken to a hospital. And then when I got to the hospital, I couldn't see him, but I was taken to the police station and interrogated. Um, because when we got to the hospital and the, the, of the doctor told us that, um, he had been dead for, well, his heart had stopped for 45, about 45 minutes. Um, and he wasn't sure, you know, what the condition was, but they were working on him. And a few minutes later, when the doctor came back and was, you know, she had to say was, I'm sorry. And I just completely lost it. I can't even tell you exactly who was in the room. I remember screaming. I don't remember falling to the floor, but I remember having to get up from the floor. I remember beating on the walls. Uh, I remember begging and begging and begging to see him. I just wanted to hug him one more time. I just... Uh, the doctor was saying, no, you don't want to see him. You don't want to see him like this. Um, so I didn't. I did have a, a friend take pictures on the advice of an attorney by the time he got to the morgue. So I was never like really allowed to, to see my son. And on the advice of the doctor, he kept saying, you don't want to see him. He's not what you remember. But I tell you, it, even knowing that, even having the doctors tell me that, I was still waiting for him to walk through the door when I when I got home. I was thinking, no, oh, they made a mistake. They got the wrong person, um, or they just, you know, he's just not really dead. He's in a coma, and they didn't want to upset me. I just everything. I was just still waiting, and the house was crowded uh, because everybody heard with social media and um, everything. People in the area had heard I was trying to keep it from my youngest daughter because she had a final the next day, but then my oldest daughter called and said, we got to tell her because it's all over Facebook. And that alone, just that with everybody just kind of bombarding you and, and all that reality, it was just, it was like I was a different person. I was like watching somebody else's life. And the, the grief or the pain hadn't really hit me yet because like I said, I was sitting there in the house and it was his uh, fiance and her mom's house and I was sitting there. The house was full and everybody was talking about everything and I was focused on the door because I knew he was going to walk through it. Um, for the first month, I didn't do anything but cry. And I would go in the closet, close the door and cry because everybody would say, well, how are you doing, Sharon? How is, and you know, and I would be like, oh, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm sad, but okay. But I was not okay, I was falling apart. And uh, his daughter was two and a half years old at the time. Uh, she was in the car when he was shot. I found out he had been shot 10 times. I found out a lot of the other details about it. And uh, when this happens to a family, you don't really have quiet time or time to grieve because not only is the press coming at you, you have neighbors and everything. You have you, the story is repeated all over Facebook. People are saying things about your child or about the situation. And it's, it's horrible. 
and it's just hard to, to take because it hurts every day. And um, Silicon Valley Diva was like more of a support group for me because number one, as time passes, people get sick of hearing your story. Um, as far as any type of legal battle that you're going to have, um, it's more just in, into the facts of what's going on and they're not really there to be compassionate. They just have to state the facts and not realizing that those facts always hurt. I started seeing a, a psychologist uh, because I was sick. At least I thought I was physically sick and I was tested and my doctors were saying, no, there's nothing wrong. We can't find anything physically wrong. And then my psychologist told me with the level of grief, it just altered my brain chemistry. I didn't even think that was possible. And my, I was telling my body I was sick. So I started taking antidepressants five and a half years later. Uh, I'm still taking them. Um, and my, my granddaughter still, she's eight years old now. She was two and a half. She still wakes up crying for her dad. Um, I feel bad at each, each Christmas. I mean, Thanksgiving is coming up and, and families get together on holidays and we have family reunions, things like that. And I always feel like I can never really have that because my family's never gonna really be there because my son's not there. And uh, as far as trying to find out details from the police, I felt like I was being treated like I was a criminal. I felt like my, my son was villainized, like he was a criminal. He didn't have a record, he was not under arrest. And, and it, the way it affects families, well, you realize that the grief is never gonna end. You know, you realize that now this is just a part of your life and it's, I'm sorry, I'm looking for a Kleenex. <laughs> Okay. And you realize that the grief is just never going to, to stop. And I started fighting because this is a feeling. These are experiences that I don't ever want anybody to have to go through. It's just, I can't describe the pain to you. I can describe some of the symptoms of the pain. Like some days I'll, I'll, when I dream about Phil, and it's so real, then I have to wake up and remember he's not here. Sometimes I feel like I hear his voice. Um, it's just the fact that he's just never, ever, ever going to be here. And I know that's what death does, like in everybody's case, but that was my baby. Yes, he was 23 years old. But I mean, even everyone on this panel, I'll bet your parent, your mom still thinks of you as her baby. It's just that part doesn't change and I just even now as I talk about it it just it just always hurts I just wanted to hug my baby one more time I start thinking that I tell him I loved him enough times that I tell him I was proud of him for trying to go to school and work and take care of his baby and he was planning on getting married and all these things all these plans did he know how I felt was he why was he having this breakdown all these things happen to you and as a mother you blame yourself and it doesn't matter how many times you hear it's not your fault. You're going to always think, but yeah, I'm the mom. I should have known something. And it's just the, it, the grief cuts so deep and it's never going to go away. And that's why I decided, you know what, Phil's rights were violated. He was not given an opportunity to change his mind. So I just feel like I never want that to happen. That should be corrected. The policies that allow that need to be changed and they're not gonna change if all, I do, all I'm doing is sitting in the closet crying. So I, you know, I've, I've participated in protests and I've, I've read about policies and I've been reading about things that the, the Congress, these uh, like SB 1421, getting involved in things like that. And, and I'm telling you, I was not prepared for it to take this long. I was thinking three years max. But I've decided, you know what, it hurts every time. But if it takes me 30 years, if I'm still here, I'm still going to be fighting with, with what little breath I have left. I'm still going to be fighting if it's not done because no one should experience the pain of losing a child. No one should experience after that happens being treated 
like a criminal. No one should be treated like they don't have a voice or they're not important and their child is not important. Thank Thanks, you. Sharon. Thank you for sharing that. So it sounds like you feel there's still a lot of meaningful change that still needs to happen. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, you know, and I want to turn to press freedom because we wouldn't know as much about policing in our communities and the Black Lives Matter movement um, without journalists who serve oftentimes as the public's eyes and ears. But records collected by the US Press Freedom Tracker show that reporters and photographers are consistently um, being prevented from doing their jobs during protests. Just this year, there were nearly 900 reported aggressions against journalists at the Black Lives Matter protests, um, including more than 200 arrests. And Ramona, I wanna to turn to you because in a June letter from the editor, uh, published in San Jose Spotlight, you've criticized San Jose police for its botched execution of a last minute curfew, I should say the botched execution in quotes, um, of a last minute curfew and you called on City Hall to be more thoughtful in how it came up with policies. Can you take us through the events that prompted you to write that letter and tell us whether you think um, that's indicative of a bigger problem? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, you know, taking a step back to what prompted that letter, um, San Jose Spotlight, like many other outlets, you know, was covering the protests after uh, the killing of George Floyd. And it was actually the third day of protests. I believe it was Sunday, May 31st. And that was the first day that the city had also implemented this curfew. Um, I received a text message from one of our journalists, a freelance journalist who works for us named Luke Johnson. And he had texted me saying that he had just been detained by police. He was out there covering the protest for us, getting photographs, interviewing people. Um, and I was shocked. You know, I, I, I had never heard of something like that happening here in San Jose. Um, I've been working in uh, the city as a reporter for a long time. I've never myself come across this kind of, um, you know, aggression toward journalists. So um, very surprising. And the part that was most, I think, disappointing and surprising to me was that he had identified himself as a journalist. He had told the officers very clearly that he is a journalist, he's here on an assignment, he's doing his job, and he was still ordered to the ground. He was um, basically threatened with a baton, a baton was swung over his head. He was put on the ground and told to stay there for about 20 minutes. The officers took off and just left him on the ground. He didn't know what to do. Um, even after, again, identifying himself as a journalist. Um, and, and so for me, the next day, I reached out and, and connected with uh, the former police chief, Eddie Garcia, he's now retired, but at the time, the police chief, um, and just asked him, like, you know, what happened? How did this occur? And why wasn't he let go when he was told that he was a journalist? Um, and the information that was given to me was what prompted the call and what prompted the letter, because what I learned was that um, off the officers who were out there at City Hall that day enforcing this curfew order essentially weren't even fully briefed on it. Um, Chief Garcia told me that he received an email from city administrators at 2.50 p.m. that day that a curfew was going into effect at, I believe it was, um, I think five and a half hours later that night, I think 8.30 p.m. that night was when it was going to go into effect. So the officers, the three o'clock shift, were out in the field already enforcing this curfew order when it was sent to Chief Garcia 10 minutes before. And he had said he didn't have time to brief the officers. Um, so blindly, they're headed out there enforcing this curfew order and not knowing what it entails. So he had told me that the officers did not know that press were exempt from this curfew order, that journalists can be out after the curfew because they were doing their job. Um, and that's what occurred. And he apologized. He was very gracious about it. But I think at the end of the day, it created such a chilling effect for my organization, for other journalists. We were not the only ones. Um, a reporter also from the Mercury News was detained alongside our journalist. Um, and for me, it was very much indicative of a bigger problem because it was very much a knee-jerk reaction from San Jose City Hall. It felt to me like, you know, this was the third day of protests. This was almost a week since George Floyd had been killed. Other cities had already put in curfew orders. Um, in San Jose, it almost felt like you know, three days in, put in a curfew order that didn't even last more than a few days. It wasn't thoughtfully executed. It felt like it was 
slapped together very quickly to appease the community and not really taking into consideration how it could potentially backfire. And for a lot of people who were peacefully protesting, you know, we heard stories about people getting detained who were literally just standing on the sidewalk um, out after curfew. So it wasn't just affecting journalists out there doing their jobs, it was also affecting people who were peacefully out there, you know, um, you know, exercising their right to freedom of speech. And what's the impact on your readers, on the general public who, you know, rely on those reporters and read your publication and need to know what's happening? That's where they get their news. Absolutely. Yeah, we are the eyes and ears of the community. We're out there. Um, journalists are putting themselves at risk every single day, right, to get that story, to bring you the information as it's happening on the front lines. And we take that responsibility very seriously. And I think when something like this happens, um, when a journalist is essentially, um, you know, hampered from doing their job, it does create a chilling effect in the community. And it makes it so much harder for us to be able to get that information and bring it back to our readers to give them credible sources of information. I think in this day and age where everybody has a cell phone, everybody has a camera, there's so much information coming at you at all times, um, especially in these kind of contentious situations, you need journalists more than ever to sift through that information and tell you what's true, what's real, what's fact-based. Um, and so, you know, I think it does. It really creates a situation where there's aggression and there's confrontation and it makes it that much harder for journalists to feel safe when they're out there in the field doing their job, doing what they were they were assigned to do. And there was a measure, there was an effort earlier this year to get a bill passed in California designed to prevent police attacks on journalists and kind of just add protections for journalists. And I want to turn to you, Nikki. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that measure, what it would have done, and why it ultimately failed? Sure. Well, um, so SB 629 was a bill that built on an existing law to uh, give journalists rights to interact with and go um, sort of take uh, refuge near a police command center uh, during an event. And this helps protect the journalists and helps them avoid getting caught up in the protests. And that clearly was different here in the protest this summer because these crowds were moving uh, through the streets. And so without a static place, you have basically a permeable uh, and moving command center, which poses a new set of, of circumstances that we haven't really, journalists have, have not had to deal with as much as they had this summer. And so that raised issues of um, you know journalists in, that know the police and that have been there for many years may have had access to behind the police line, whereas uh, bloggers or people in Los Angeles who, uh, where there are many reporters and they might not know law enforcement as well, were not getting those same, um, that same treatment. So this bill attempted to address that. It's attempted to address the moving element of these protests. And it also attempted to give journalists recourse right in the moment, because when you're talking about a journalist who's covering an event and is the eyes and ears for the community, every time, every second that they are detained, advocates of, for the press are saying, you're also preventing that continued reporting. So that's the violation in and of itself. And if you can contact a supervisor or somehow um, prove, show that you were a journalist and the bill contemplated what that would look like, um, and it, it actually took a definition from existing law, uh, and you can then you can get a supervisor on the phone or um, and somehow basically appeal your detention so that you could be put right back out um, to do continue doing news gathering. And uh, the governor vetoed the bill saying that that definition, which is from existing law, um, was too broad and really could encompass white nationalists and other people that are actually instigating. Um, whether that's true or not, whether, you know, that is probably still to be seen how the legislature can come up with something to address that next year. And the governor released guidelines in asking the legislature to, to look at his uh, uh, review of, of what has happened. There's a list of recommendations and, um, and said, 
the legislature, you look at what we should do, but that includes post training. So more training of first amendment, um, which addresses one of the issues here, which we have a generation of law enforcement officers that across the state, especially in smaller jurisdictions may not have had protests like these um, for many years. Um, so ensuring that officers are aware of first amendment rights so that they do listen and say, okay, this is a reporter, we're gonna let them go. We're not gonna detain them. Um, and so the, there are a number, also kettling people and corralling, um, basically making people move itself causes um, violence potentially. So looking at whether that's appropriate to move crowds. Um, so there's a number of recommendations and considerations within the governor's uh, guidelines and that provide a, a roadmap for policymakers, lawmakers to address this more fully next year, because you have to consider the legislative session this year was at the backdrop of COVID and we were trying to uh, fulfill constitutional obligations and in voting on, on things. And um, it was a difficult year to truly work the process as it usually does. So there were, we usually have, you know, 15 hearings in our, uh, our committee and we had, I think three. So it just limited the ability for policymakers to do their jobs the way they normally would do them. Got it. And council member, as a local lawmaker, I wondered if you could weigh, on, weigh in on these things. You know, when you hear Ramona talking about um, the execution of the curfew and then, uh, you know, the issue of identifying journalists and, and looking at the definition that we have of journalists and what is it like for the rank and file out on the streets, you know, in, in enforcing these policies? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Just b before I, I answer, uh, I just want to say thank you as well to, to Sharon for, for uh, kind of level setting the conversation today. Uh, I didn't understand fully how deeply my mother cared for me until I had my own son two years ago. Um, and, and so that, that, that love uh, that, you, that you get from your mother, um, certainly nothing else like that. And so um, I appreciate you being willing to, to share that story. And, and on uh, don't know if you've heard it, but on behalf of, of uh, the city uh, and, and the police department, I, I apologize uh, for how you were treated um, after that, uh, as well as uh, in general, apologize on behalf of the system that uh, your son that deserved help uh, ended up losing his life. Um, and certainly here, uh, a reason why I think, you know, for, for myself uh, participating not only today, but, but in uh, elected office to, to try and, and, and move our world uh, in a better place. Uh, and specifically here, the opportunities, I think what we have uh, in San Jose, because this is uh, my home, uh, born and raised and have had an, an opportunity not only being as an officer, but now as an elected official. Um, and so sort of uh, tying it into to the question, um, you know, I think there certainly were a lot of challenges and, and for rank and file officers, uh, there's one thing that they, they do fairly well, which is uh, follow orders. And, uh, and if you can give some clear orders, um, then traditionally you'll, you'll get uh, officers following those fairly well. And as Ramona pointed out, in this case, uh, there was a very last minute decision that went in to impose, for instance, the curfew. Um, and as just a, an example as of the many kind of policies and procedures that, that um, are being discussed as uh, Nikki pointed out up at the state level and all the way down. Um, but sometimes uh, these decisions that get made uh, hastily um, end up not being executed uh, the way that they should. And, uh, and if you don't actually properly inform and educate individuals, uh, and as Nikki pointed out, if, if you don't have the experience, and I'll tell you, uh, I don't know uh, many cities across the country that experienced uh, within the last couple decades the, the type of protest that we experienced this summer. So even for the city of San Jose, that came out in our after action report um, that uh, that was one of the major challenges was that the officers that we have working today, even those that have been on for 20 plus years, have not had not experienced, uh, had, had that experience of a protest like this. And, and that certainly puts uh, anybody uh, in, in, um, you know, in, in, at a detriment for how they might react and respond. And one of those uh, ways was this curfew. And in fact, uh, this was such a quick decision. It didn't even involve the city council. It was a decision that was made by our city administrator, our, our um, 
uh, uh, our city administrator in a conversation with Eddie Garcia, because actually our chief of police, Eddie, had requested a curfew on Saturday. Uh, after, after the first night of the protest on Saturday, the chief had been in, in conversations uh, with our city manager on, on uh, imposing a curfew. It did not happen um, that day. Uh, but then was uh, was ultimately decided that they would do it. I believe they did briefly consult the mayor as well, uh, but 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 fairly briefly before they they decided to implement it. And then, as Ramona pointed out, for the rank and file officers, there was uh, the group of the swing shift officers that went out and actually dealt with the majority of the protests uh, because of the time frame of their 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 uh, when they come into work. And they did not get a briefing. Uh, they were essentially, you know, it was a, almost a word of mouth transformation of, hey, we, we now have a curfew that's been implemented by the city. And, uh, and that was it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, they're thinking, okay, nobody's allowed to be out past this time. And that's about as much as, as they were informed of. You can't expect, um, you know, I don't care who the officer is, right? You can't expect the officers to, to get an unclear order like that and then go out and execute it perfectly and, and, um, and not violate people's rights. Um, and so actually I, uh, but it heads with the city manager and the chief of police on Tuesday, two days later, uh, and and uh, made the recommendation that we end our curfew. As Ramona pointed out, that we uh, we we ended it just as quickly as we we started it. I felt personally it was doing more harm than good, and um, and and ultimately we decided to do that as a council that day. Uh, and so our curfew ended on Tuesday. It was enacted on Sunday, and it was it was over. Oh, excuse me, it was it was over. Uh, we gave it a 24-hour time frame to be able to to implement that. Actually, because we we learned from that Sunday, and we said let's let's make sure we go out and we educate everybody, including our community and all the officers uh, that we're going a different direction. So we actually gave it a bit of a buffer, but um, that's the same thing for, for any other policies, especially those coming down from the state, as you pointed out. You can imagine these are not necessarily front and center for the, the rank and file officers. They're being worked on as policies up at the state level until they actually get passed and adopted and then written into you know um, uh, police officer standards and training books and then brought down into a training to officers, they're, they're typically not well known. Now, they may be something that the chief of police and um, you know, some of, uh, of, of the captains or, or the higher ranking officers are aware of because they're, they're required to, to, to be in touch with that. But your rank and file officer is not gonna really get that information until it sinks down into trainings at a, at a, a post-training level. And so there's, there's, I think there's, you know, there's just some realities on, on just the way uh, we as humans, right, learn and, and, and are able to, to, to take in information and then, and then be able to, to, to react to that information properly. Thank you. Well, I want to talk more about some policies that some reform reforms that did get enacted. Um, of course, these protests and the worldwide uprisings that we've seen this year over the death of George Floyd are part of a long history of similar events. Um, in 2018, Sacramento police killed Stephon Clark. People marched in the streets and some laws did change. Um, Tanaya, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the laws and those laws that, that got enacted. Uh, as a re result of that killing and what they've meant for the public's right to know. Sure, yes, um, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, yeah, so for a very long period, um, since the 1970s, California was in fact one of the most secretive states in the nation when it came to information about how the police do their job. And you're right, in 2018, the, the momentum for changing that reached the tipping point and the legislature realized that having more information is absolutely critical for communities to understand how they're being policed, to look at these specific, you know, tragic incidents and figure out what went wrong in those incidents. And then also to just look at broader patterns of policing and to see how, um, how you, you know, uses of force are being deployed in a broader pattern, how officers um, are being disciplined or not disciplined in a broader pattern. And so in 2018, um, the legislature passed two laws. And the first was uh, Senate Bill 1421 or SB 1421. And this law says that uh, um, records of four different categories of, um, of incidents have to be made public. And those are that um, records of officer involved shootings, um, records of uses, certain uses of force. And those are uses of force resulting in death or great bodily injury. Um, and also 
sustained findings of two different types of misconduct. So sustained findings of dishonesty and sustained findings of sexual assault. All of those different types of categories of records now have to be made public under California's Public Records Act. So the public um, now has a right to go in and demand this information from their local government, from their local police agency, and, and try to learn what's happening. Um, and the other law that got passed was Assembly Bill 748, and that similarly opened up access to video and audio recordings of specific incidents. And those were officer-involved shootings and uses of force resulting in death or great bodily injury. And so the point of this law was to ensure very rapid access, very rapid public access to the recordings of these incidents so that the public can, you know, when an incident happens, the public isn't sitting around in the dark speculating over, you know, some, what, what the events might have been. There's at least um, a, a, a supposed to be a very timely disclosure of that, um, the raw footage, essentially. Um, so those are two, the two laws and, um, you know, the, the, they, they sort of open, they're trying to open up to community inspection a lot more of the things that, that these types of records that previously had been very hard to obtain. Are these laws working? What does compliance actually look like now, you know, two years after they were passed? Right, well, you, you know, um, the theory is one thing and the implementation is the other, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it's spotty. Um, and it, there have been local governments, there have been agencies that have really embraced the idea of openness have really sort of gotten the gotten the fact that if, if the community is going to trust their police, um, then there has to be this more openness. Um, it, it simply can't be secret because people do not trust a secretive government. Um, but other agencies, unfortunately, are still stuck in the old way of thinking, and they are still instead of embracing. Um, the, the point of these laws and embracing disclosure, they're kind of looking for ways to um, evade. And so, you know, the, we've seen a lot of things. I mean, the first thing we saw, in fact, was that police unions up and down the state, as soon as SB 1421 came into effect, police unions up and down the state filed dozens of lawsuits trying to argue that the law couldn't be applied to any records prior to 2019. And so, that would have really harmed the public understanding because nobody would have been able to examine anything that happened before 2019. Nobody would have been able to, to look at specific incidents that happened, or as I said, to, you know, to, to gather the information that would allow them to see patterns. Um, and so that was one thing that had to be overcome in litigation um, was to establish that the public actually has the right under these laws to look at past incidents, past incidents. And then, you know, the other thing that's been happening since then is, is agencies, as I said, looking for little loopholes or ways to narrow their obligations rather than embracing their full obligations. So, you know, it's, it's things like um, we had to litigate the fact that um, an agency cannot make an agreement with an officer, um, like a settlement agreement that will take records out of public view. So if an officer is if there's a sustained finding that an officer committed dishonesty or an officer committed sexual assault, the agency and the officer can't make a secret agreement to, to hide those records from the public. And that was one thing we had to, you know, try and establish through litigation because agencies were wanting to do that. And, um, you know, as another example, um, agencies, some agencies have been trying to um, interpret their um, obligation to disclose um, records of incidents of great bodily injury. They want to interpret that fairly narrowly. And so far, two trial courts have said, no, you can't do that. You actually have to broadly interpret what great bodily injury means so, so as to promote public access to these records. Um, but that, that's one that kind of comes up. Um, and then, you know, something else that happens is that, that a lot of agencies just drag their feet. And so the people request these records and it can take months or even years to get anything. And that, you know, it's sort of a, a denial by delay tactic that, that happens. Can I, can I jump in on that last point there? Just because um, I think we experienced that here. We're experiencing it actually right now. The city's getting sued uh, for our slow response on, on uh, some of these requests. 
And there, there is, I'll tell you, at least from my standpoint, and certainly the elected officials here in the city, we have no interest in, in personally delaying any of the information. But what we did get was we got a plethora of requests as this law went into effect. And there are only a handful of data analysts at our police department, because again, prior to this law, there just traditionally wasn't that many public records requests. And so we actually had to, to make some sort of mid-year budget decisions to, uh, to beef up the data analyst positions within the police department, just to be able to, to filter through the requests, but it still was not necessarily enough. Um, and so really, I think, I think that will improve, certainly I know for the city of San Jose, as time goes on, this was sort of the floodgates opened, right? And, and, and everybody and media agencies and a lot of individuals were requesting information. And for us, it was just too much too fast. And so literally that's how we have been responding with some of these requests was, hey, we, we literally don't have the people power and we've had to hire up and to try to get through. There's, uh, there, there is still a lot of personal information redacting people's names or, or addresses and whatnot in some of these cases. And so there, there, there does have to be time that's taken before some of them are, are uh, made public. And so that's one of the challenges that we deal with that I think is not necessarily nef nefarious, right? It just happens to be that, that the reality of what, what we got as the floodgates open was more than we could handle. I think that will improve as we move forward. And I think it will be easier to kind of tell, all right, are you really just dragging your feet or is it, you know, is this um, something that was just a, a slower pace in the beginning and you were able to catch up? Thanks for jumping in on that. Um, I want to talk about some of the state laws that were under consideration this recently adjourned legislative session. Um, what those were all about, what they would have done, and why they got derailed. And Nikki, you kind of alluded to this. You mentioned that with COVID, um, there have been fewer meetings, and it's just been harder to get work done in the Capitol. Um, but I was wondering if you could walk us through uh, some of those laws that were under consideration this session and what happened there. Sure. So the last night of session, things got a little bit crazy and um, measures died on the floor that that may have gotten to the governor's desk. Um, and there's two uh, in particular. One was uh, SB 776, which was building on SB 1421 and was an attempt by Senator Skinner to beef up the enforcement mechanisms within the uh, that structure of requiring disclosure. And it included double attorney's fees and uh, up to a thousand dollar daily fine for delaying disclosure. And that was an intent to create a real hammer on uh, and, and get at the agencies that uh, reportedly are not producing records across the state. It also included some expansion of categories of records that were not in the initial um, disclosure law. And this was in light of New York completely deleting their uh, re privacy restrictions altogether. So that bill uh, got off of the assembly floor with 60 plus votes, which is shocking. I mean, when 1421 was passed, it got 41 votes and it was white knuckled and uh, very difficult to get that bill to the governor's desk as an advocate. Um, watching 776 fly off the floor uh, was, uh, just shows you how much the public sentiment and the legislative sentiment has shifted in this time. Um, but then the bill was not be able to be taken up uh, before midnight. So that, I expect Senator Skinner will bring that back with many of the provisions, if not, um, a stronger attempt at disclosure uh, for categories of records. Um, uh, I think the biggest issue that has shaken out in the public eye is what it, where it, what is that sustained level? At what level does something become sustained and what kind of um, maybe even unsustained claims that are investigated should be disclosed? So that, that's kind of an ongoing issue. And the other bill that died on the Senate floor without being taken up was AB 66. And that would have limited rubber bullets and tear gas uh, use on crowds, chemical agents. Um, again, that gets at 
what the governor's recommendations were to um, find out really force is self-escalating. So how do they conduct police response without um, using force as much as possible? So minimizing the use of tear gas and rubber bullets seems to be something that the governor is calling for, but it didn't get off of the, the floor. Um, so I think that those, there was a ban on chokeholds and um, there, so that's one shift that did go into place. There were some other criminal justice, broader reforms, juvenile justice reforms that went into place. I think the most disappointing for the community was a uh, bill, I think it's 2054 by Sydney Comlogger in Los Angeles. And that would have created an ability for police to respond for mental health teams to respond um, instead of police in certain incidents. And so a lot of the discussion is how do we take police out of incidents where being bringing guns might really escalate and how can we bring health providers um, if that's who's trained to deal with the kind of response that's needed um, so that you don't have a family tragedy and and then when those family tragedies do happen um, that a family is not left without the information that they that their government is not fighting them to understand what happened you mentioned the use of rubber rubber bullets um, and there that's something that's been examined at the local level as well as the state level so i wanted to turn to local measures that the San Jose City Council considered, including a possible ban on rubber bullets against protesters. Um, council member, you initially stated support for banning rubber bullets altogether and told San Jose Spotlight that the extensive collateral damage they cause uh, to innocent protesters just isn't acceptable. And I'm curious why you ultimately did vote to allow their use. Yeah, thank you. And actually, I, I've had to kind of clear the, the, I think the misunderstanding cleared up a couple of times, um, but I'm, I'm glad I'm able to, to do that here because my position actually remained the same. It, the mayor's changed and, and he had asked for a little bit further uh, ban than what we had originally came out with. Uh, the original memo and the original direction that I had set out and asked for um, was that we should ban the rubber bullets, the use of them to disperse a crowd or for specifically for crowd dispersing measures. That's ultimately what we did pass. Uh, 10 council members agreed to it. What, what the mayor had asked uh, at the, the end of that process was that we actually do ban them altogether. So sort of what you're saying now, which was that, that we actually would not um, utilize them in any crowd situation. Um, that wasn't how far I wanted to go when we started off. Uh, it wasn't what we had put in our, our memo. Um, and it was something again that, that the mayor added on at the end. And it was something that ultimately uh, the, the 10 council members did not agree with. Uh, and the reason why, so specifically the reason, first off, the reason why I think uh, we definitely should have done what we did do, which was ban them for use of, of dispersing the crowd. Uh, because if you think about it, that, that's just a terrible policy uh, in and of itself. We literally had a policy that told police officers they could shoot these rubber bullets and ricochet them off the ground simply to disperse a crowd. So you wouldn't actually need a, a, an aggressive individual. Um, you would just need a crowd that is not dispersing. That's it. So I, I, once you've issued an order for uh, a, a lawful uh, order to disperse, and if they don't disperse, our duty manual policy allowed our officers and they, they utilized that right within the policy. Um, during the first um, the first few nights of protest, to simply just shoot into to the crowd by ricocheting uh, these rubber bullets off the ground, um, and and a lot of people, a lot of very innocent people, got injured. Um, and in fact, obviously there there's uh, a lot of, uh, of of continuous challenges right now. We had uh, and we have actually um, um, an individual, Derek Sanderlin here, that's joined us today, uh, that was uh, tremendously injured, and. Um, and so I 100% did not agree that that was, our, that was our policy and that we should change that. Ultimately, what I did not agree with was that um, an officer should not have an ability to be able to utilize the, the tool of, of a rubber bullet um, in a crowded situation, but specifically only against someone that was a violent aggressor. 
um, meaning no longer could they just use it to ricochet or to disperse a crowd. They actually need to, to aim it, direct it at a violent aggressor. And in fact, what, what we put into the duty manual policy uh, was uh, the third section of it now states that they, they also can be held accountable for any innocent uh, victims, bystanders that are not the violent aggressor that get injured or hit by uh, the rubber bullet. Similar to the, the same thing as an officer using their firearm. Um, they can't just indiscriminately shoot their firearm and not be concerned with somebody that's behind or beside uh, somebody else that could be injured. And that's exactly now that the same level of standard that officers have to use when they disperse a rubber bullet. If somebody else uh, that is not the intended target gets hit, uh, they can be held uh, uh, liable and accountable for that. So that's the policy that we did put in place. Um, I think it, it, it was fair. Certainly, again, I think a lot of individuals can argue that they don't think it went far enough. Um, I know the state was debating it. We were sort of you know, we, we moved forward with our own. Uh, we were eagerly wondering what the state was going to do. And I think, we, as we've heard, a lot of these policies did not make it through. I think some of them will, um, you know, as we move forward next year. And, and we may see some uh, more or even potentially less restrictive. But, but no doubt we'll continue to uh, ourselves review some of these policies. Um, and one of the, the other things that I asked for, actually, as, as a, a whole picture, was something that I called reimagining policing, uh, that where I said, I really want to engage the entire community. Uh, and and be able to, to understand how do we actually reimagine? We've now changed it to reimagining public safety, uh, but how do we actually reimagine that? How do we reimagine how we utilize our officers? Uh, again, for instance, in 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 uh, Sharon's case, um, right with with her son Philip, um, an individual that needed mental health services, and in fact, over twenty five percent, twenty six percent actually of Americans in their life on every year. Uh, about 26% of Americans are gonna, are gonna suffer from a mental illness. Uh, that is a significant amount of people. And when you have instances of somebody losing their life because of that versus getting help, uh, that, that is absolutely something that we need to be looking at. And, and the fact that today, the number one uh, resource that we utilize to respond to people suffering from a mental health crisis are police officers, people that are you know armed and 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 not not at all right mental health professionals. I was a I was a trained crisis intervention officer. It's a forty hour training. I was by no means right a professional. I had a baseline of knowledge which was better than maybe uh, you know other officers, but by no means was I somehow a, you know a, a, a trained professional mental health worker. And and that's where we really where I think you know we start we need to start to look. How do we actually change the way that we're responding to our community's concerns? Um, and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's from the use of the, the tools and the equipment, like banning rubber bullets, uh, choke hold, something that the city of San Jose actually did uh, about three, four years ago, and, and simply how we, how we utilize our resources. Are police officers the right people to be going out to all of these calls? And if not, let's get, let's get the right trained professionals to do so. I want to make sure to incorporate some of our audience um, comments and questions as we're coming up on the end of the program. We have two comments about the delays on transparency um, in terms of responding to those public records. Uh, one audience member says, you know, departments knew these requests were coming. Another says it was no surprise that there would be additional demand for public records. So the council and all councils should have planned for and funded additional positions. Uh, we also have a related question for Sharon. Do you feel like, Sharon, you ever got full transparency um, when it comes to your son's killing? I'm glad that uh, you asked me that because I was gonna put something in, in the chat that I wanted to respond to. As far as the delays, because uh, Silicon Valley Diva are the ones that are actually putting in the request for me, um, I still can't like bring myself to read all the things that happened during when my son was killed. And no, there there, there continues to be a delay. And that, um, I mean, I, I, I heard what the uh, council member said, but when you combine that delay with the fact that the way the families are treated, we've uh, asked us to meet with the mayor and the mayor has refused to meet with us. We have asked in the past to meet with uh, Chief Garcia, he has refused to meet with us. This new unit that they've created to have uh, police officers, dress down police officers, officers go out with uh, health, uh, mental health care profession, professionals um, that, has, that has been 
created, but no one consulted us as far as the total effect on the family. So to me, they're not really 100% prepared. So no, I do not feel that we have, have been given all information. And with the history of how we have been treated, it's almost as though we're invisible or would throw away people. And that's where that lack of trust, and that's where it seems as though they're just delaying just because they can. And, and using the, uh, the lack of having the staff as an excuse because you, you're, you're wanting to get all this extra money to put into weapons and, and, and other things like that. Well, if you're wanting to increase your budget, how about increasing it on getting these, this information to the families that have been waiting for this information? Because uh, we only we get a little bit of information and then you get emails saying, oh, we need more time, we need more time, we need more time. Well, increase your staff, use some of that money that, that uh, you're fighting so hard to keep because you don't wanna be defunded to uh, get more staff so that the families can have the information that they're asking for. And when we re request the meeting, stop turning us down and ignoring us and treating us like we're invisible. Uh, if, or if you don't want to meet with us, you don't want to talk to us, then stop hiding behind some unit that, that is just like not even really a step in the right direction. It's a step in place. Stop hiding behind these fluffy efforts as though you are doing something to really address the family's needs. And we're not even considered victims. Like my granddaughter, she was in the car when her daddy was shot 10 times. And, and I'm still waiting for something to happen to her and how that she's going to be affected. To say she won't be affected is very naive. Uh, so she's going to be affected, but she has no support for the city of San Jose for any kind of support. His fiance and her mom were there and they witnessed this and they experienced PTSD, but there is no support for them to get any kind of psychological, psychological support. I'm fortunate, I'm working, I had insurance. If I didn't have that, there would be no support for me. So these things that, that they're say they're attempting to do, I have no confidence in the sincerity. And that's judging from, from the past. Like I said, it's just five and a half years ago. And no, I didn't start fighting right away, maybe about two or three months after. And ever since then, I've been invisible. I've been either an invisible person to them or a throwaway person. Whichever way you put it, it's like I'm not even there. I'm sorry to hear that, Sharon. Thank you for talking about your experience. I know it's not been easy to say the least. Um, Can I, just to respond to one of the last points. Well, first off, and, and again, as I mentioned in the beginning, Sharon, you, you're completely right. Uh, the way that uh, individuals like yourself in circumstances where they've lost a loved one are treated is, is despicable and unacceptable. The city actually does have, and the, the county actually has a program, um, Victim Witness, which you're probably aware of, where um, the, 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 the victims uh, of crimes, the witnesses, their family members are entitled to services. But as you point out, rightfully so, an individual that may be shot by an officer and killed their family members are not entitled to that to that service, and that is and that is that is unacceptable. I would agree with that one hundred percent. And that's actually uh, something that we have discussed, and one of the things that we want to include within this reimagining of policing, which would be something that would be funded both in partnership potentially by the city and the county uh, as a service to to be able to provide to families because uh, you are victims one hundred percent, right? What what you have suffered, what any loved one. Um, uh, any of Philip's loved ones, especially those that were there, as you point out, uh, the mental suffering that those individuals face, why our county, why our, our system would not want to provide a service to those individuals to help them through that process um, is, is beyond me. But the reality is, is that that's, that's what we have right now. We have a system that says, sorry, you're not a victim, so you don't get that service, uh, and, other, and, and yet other people do. Um, and so I think certainly a lot of, of great you know, opportunities that we have, uh, no doubt that, that these things don't happen fast enough. Um, and certainly it's not an excuse to say, hey, we don't have staff, but there is a reality that, that, that you know, that just is the answer when it comes to certain things like uh, record finding, because we do have to make decisions every year on where it is that we spend taxpayers' dollars. And we don't have the luxury of just saying, let's donate it all, or, or excuse me, let's direct it all to uh, one particular cause. And we, we have to, to cut 
all over the place, just like this year, $120 million. And when we do that, it does make it challenging to, to be able to, to get enough funding everywhere where we would want it, including, again, myself on, on being able to, to make some of these things happen faster. But they would not if people like Sharon weren't fighting for it, I guarantee you. And so I think the fact that people are pushing to make these changes is the only reason they actually do happen. Um, from the protests down to, 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 to these kind of conversations and, and Sharon, I, I am open anytime you wanna have a conversation. I apologize that you've gotten uh, a, a shut door from the city uh, administrators right as of now. Um, you are not invisible and, and certainly wanna give you that space um, if you desire. I'll ask one last question to just kind of look to the future um, before we, we wrap, because uh, thank you all for being with us still. I know we've gone over a few minutes. Um, Tanaya or anyone, if you could jump in and comment on what laws and policies should be adopted to protect protester rights, press freedom, to promote police transparency, uh, any one of those or, or all of them. and. Uh, yeah, what holes remain to be filled? How can we do better? Well, I mean, as a transparency expert, um, that's, that's why I'm here. I mean, I, I honestly, I thought SB 776 was a really good start. I was deeply disappointed that um, it, it didn't get signed into law and I hope that it will get there. Um, I definitely think that, um, you know, more transparency is better. So the idea that we could get, get beyond some, some narrow categories of records and, and get a broader disclosure of records. Um, the, the, this is all about the public's business and, and the public really does have a right to know. Um, and, and providing, you know, sort of clearer requirements to the agencies to be transparent is also another step in the right direction, which SB 776 was going for, was, you know, sort of saying like, okay, now you've had two years, two and a half years, since us before 1421, it's kind of time to get with it. Um, so I think that, that those were, you know, great things to, to have happen. And I, and I hope that they, I really hope they get passed this year. Absolutely. And one last question for Ramona as well. Um, you know, talking about this kind of push for transparency, this movement, how has it affected your newsroom, the editorial decisions you guys are making and how you're looking at covering these issues in the future? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, you know, obviously one of the tenets of journalism is that we hold the powerful accountable, that we are asking those tough questions, um, that we are basically doing the business of the people by getting these answers. And um, the events of this past year have only inspired us to do more of that work. I think at this point, we're putting in more Public Records Act requests than we ever have before. Um, we're being more persistent. We're being more consistent. Um, I think we're also exploring legal measures and avenues, thanks to folks like the First Amendment Coalition, um, you know, transparency experts and lawyers, we're able to fight for these records. As, as Councilman Perales mentioned, the, the city of San Jose is in a lawsuit now. And I think for the first time we're seeing um, newspapers and journalism organizations fighting harder than ever for their right to these records. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're gonna hopefully see some changes where there's gonna be some, some teeth to, to these policies that, that, you know, when they are delaying us and they're stopping us from being able to access these records are doing it in so many different ways, including, you know, giving us unreasonable costs, telling us that producing a record is gonna cost thousands of dollars. There's so many ways, so many loopholes that they use to get past giving us those records that, that are public. So I think it's just inspired journalism organizations like Santa's Spotlight to go harder and to just not let up and to continue to um, make those requests, even if they're denied, um, to appeal those requests if they are denied, and to just continue our mission of, of trying to get those answers, because that is what the public deserves. Well, thank you for doing that work. And thank you for everyone who watched this program, stayed with us, engaged, um, chatted us your comments and questions. If you enjoyed this program and wanna see more of this, you can support San Jose Spotlight and the First Amendment Coalition. Uh, people can support San Jose Spotlight by becoming a sustaining member with a recurring monthly or annual donation or making a one-time tax deductible do donation. And you can also stay connected by signing up for their free daily newsletter and following them on social media. You can also support the First Amendment Coalition by becoming a member. Membership is free and you'll get 
priority access to our free legal hotline. You'll receive our newsletter, invitations to events like this one, and news about our litigation and other developments. Uh, you can also support our work battling government secrecy with a tax deductible contribution if you wish. So thank you again for all being here. Uh, the event again was recorded and will be available uh, within a few days on San Jose Spotlight's website. Thank you all panelists. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.